Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Oh, no. I know we're a few this right now. The people are still coming in. But you know what? We can sound big. I know we can. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Nailed it. There we go. <laughs> All right. Hey, it's good to be here today. You know what? I was just thinking as they were singing, do we really shout, let your kingdom come? Do we shout that out? Do we want to? According to him, we should. Yes. Well, a couple of you, anyway. Yes. Okay, the couple of you that said, yeah, <laughs> go ahead, shout out, let his kingdom come. Let his kingdom come. I suspect that not everybody spoke up on that last one. <laughs> sounded good, sounded good. Hey, this is the time that I want to take just a few minutes, and I want you to greet one another in the name of who? Yeshua HaMashiach, right? Amen. So greet one another, and we'll come back together and get, get things rolling again.
Maybe we could start coming back together now. Okay. <laughs> Can I have some men to come up and hold the tallit for the blessing of the children? heritage of Yahweh. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. Bless his name. Just want to lift his name up today as we bless the children. May Yahweh protect and defend you. To be in this royal a shining name. May you be like Ruth and like Boaz. May you be deserving of praise. Strengthen them, Yahweh, and keep them from the stranger's way. Let's give Yahweh a hand for our children.
endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Hey! 
forever, El Shaddai, El Ohai Don Olah, El Shaddai, El Ohai Don Olah, El Shaddai, El Ohai. Chapter 6. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in sin to let favor increase? Let it not be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were immersed in Messiah Yeshua were immersed in his death? We were therefore buried with him through immersion into death, that as Messiah was raised from the dead by the esteem of the Father, so also we should walk in newness of life. For, for if we have come to be grown together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was impaled with him, so that the body of sin might be re rendered powerless to serve sin no longer. For he who has died has been made right from sin. And if we died with Messiah, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Messiah, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer rules over him. For in that he died, he died to sin once and for all, but in that he lives, he lives to Elohim. So you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to Elohim in Messiah Yeshua our Master. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, to obey it in its desires. Neither present your members as instruments of right unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to Elohim as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to Elohim. Amen. And he has held high such more sacrifice if not joined with my life I sing in vain to
and my life so sing to you. I want to sign your name to the end of this day, knowing that my heart was true. Let my life so Justified, 
freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day.
sign in the heavens. And all the land will mourn for him. And may the look upon the one who was pierced. Coming back to Jerusalem. All the world will see Yeshua, and all the world will see salvation, and all the world will see Yeshua, all the world will see. God. With all 
creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore you Father, we come before you. We just thank you so much for this time. Father, in this time, we recognize your presence. And in this time, we recognize that we're lifting up praise and worship to you. And we just thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity to bring this worship to you through our Yeshua HaMashiach and our high priest. This is a time where we get to minister to one another through prayer. I'm going to ask the elders and their wives to come forward, please. I'm also going to ask anybody that would like to be anointed with oil today by the elders and the wives uh, come forward. And um, I'm going to have the rest of you break into your groups. If somebody is here and they don't have a group yet, make them part of your group, okay? So let's go ahead and break into the groups.
I'm 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 on. How about now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> well, as, as you know, some of you know, some of you haven't been here for a while, so you, uh, you don't know, but I'm going to inform you. <laughs> we started in the book of Roman uh, last week, and I just started off with the first seven verses last week. But in that, we actually kind of got to see a little bit about, and I talked about this some, we got to see a little bit about uh, how Paul was thinking. You know, to be honest with you, and I talked about a little bit this last, uh, last week as well, much of, the, uh, much of the church believes that Paul changed theology in the book of Romans, because they're, you know, the book of Romans is very doctrinal, okay? Now, uh, for those of you that think that the word doctrine is bad, it's not, it just means teaching, Okay, and so there are there are real doctrines that Yahweh taught. Okay, and then there's those other doctrines, something about doctrines of men and demons, right? That are not so good. <laughs> okay, and they can that they can lead you in a place you don't want to go. Well, as we looked at it this last week, we got to see, the, if you will, uh, Paul's relationship or how he viewed his relationship uh, with Yeshua. And he used a word that is probably, is, well, it's not accepted today. How about that? It's just not politically correct. Right? And that word is slave. Now, as we got to go into this and look at it, there's actually two different Greek words that mean servant or slave, or can be translated that way. The first one that I'm going to talk about is uh, it would be translated in our scriptures as a slave, but it actually means, that translated into the English, means to wait on tables. It's also translated minister in the English, and it is the same word used for what we would call the deacons or a congregational office of, that was appointed, okay? Neither, that's not the words he used, if you will. He used a word that means slave, and it's the, the word that he used, it would have been a slave that was unpaid, that was not free to go anytime he wanted to. Okay? In fact, if he ran away, he would, in, in Roman life, if he ran away, he would be hunted down and returned to his slave owner. It was the same word that was used of Omnishvus um, in, in, in Philemon. In, uh, 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 so when he, when, and, and he owned that, that guy. Okay, and if you remember, Paul returned him back <laughs> to his owner with a cover letter. And the cover letter was, was, was this. He said, I know that he ran away, so I'm returning him to you, but I want to tell you something about him. While he was with me, he was very profitable for me. Now, the, his name, this slave's name, you know what it means? It means profitable. Paul was saying he's lived out his name while he was with me. And he said, so I'm going to return to you with the hopes that because he was so valuable to me, with the hopes that you'll return him to me. By the way, he is a brother, and by the way, I led you to your salvation that set you free. <laughs> hmm. No pressure. <laughs> right? And we assume that that did take place, that he returned to uh, Shaul, to Paul, it, while Paul was in prison. Now, you know what? That's, 
that's kind of amazing to me because there was, there, was this, there was something there that we can see that happens to our lives as well. And Paul is bringing this out as he's writing this letter. He said, I am this slave. I don't, I don't owe myself. I was purchased with a price. He says, but that way is the only way that I could be free. It doesn't make rational sense. But it's the way that Yahweh has set up things so that he could bring us into true freedom. You know, in, in Torah, I didn't bring it up, but in Torah today, it says this. It, it, it tells them to follow righteousness. Wow. What do you mean? Ooh, wait, wait a minute. Follow righteousness? Yeah. You remember that cloud? <laughs> What were they doing? They were following righteousness. They were following in the footsteps. What are we called to do? We're called to be in His likeness. We're called to act like Him. We're called to follow righteousness. How amazing is that? So in the seven verses, we found out last week that if it changed, it had to, if something changed doctrinally in Paul's life, it had to change later on because it wasn't in those seven verses that I could see. Because he was talking Torah in those seven verses, right? So I'm, so I'm going to be the researcher and I'm going to start digging at where he changed something. Well, I'll tell you, he didn't do it in this section either. Okay? But I do want to show you some things. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Let's take a look at verses 8. Uh, I think it's through, through 15. First, I thank my Elohim through Yeshua Messiah for all of you because the news of your faith is being supported in, or reported excuse me, in all the world. For Elohim, whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son, is my witness that I constantly mention you, always asking in my prayers that if it is somehow in, in Yahweh's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I want very much to see you, so I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now I want you to know, brothers, that I often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now, and in order that I might have a fruitful, fruitful ministry among you, just as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am obligated both to the Greeks and barbarians, both to the, to the wise and the foolish, so I am eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time that you've given us today. I just ask that, um, that as we go through this time that you just show us the things that you would have for us today. How we ought to look, what we ought to be doing, our attitude that we ought to have. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Sometimes I forget to turn my notes. I am probably, I'm just read th those verses from 8 to 15, but I'm probably only going to get through 8 today, okay, because there's some things that I really want to talk about. Paul rejoices in, in Yahweh through Yeshua Messiah for what he sees and is, hears reported uh, from about these Roman believers, okay? So I want to look a little bit closer, and I want to just kind of pick apart, if you will, right now, the first sentence 
Okay, the first sentence. Paul says he thanks Elohim through Yeshua Messiah. The word that, that Paul uses there, this word through, in the Greek is, is dia. Now, the reason that I say that is because it, I, when I look at things, sometimes what happens when, it, when Scripture gets translated from the original language to uh, English, we add words. So it makes sense, right? Uh, there is no direct translation from Hebrew or Greek into the English that would make any sense to you at all. Because the word order is all weird. But in this case, when I looked at it in the Greek, the word through was there. That's important. Okay? That's really important for us to begin to look at this. Because then we have to begin to look at some other things as well. But I'm going to take you, if you will, the long route. So in this instance, we get to see a, a little bit of how, about how Paul is thinking. And, and in this, very, this is very important for us, especially us 21st century Americans that are so far removed from any of this, right? Wow. Slave? I thought we did away with that. You know what I mean? How do we get to this stuff? So I want to look at this, but what, he is, what I want to do is go back to Hebrews chapter 7. I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 7. And I want to look through um, chapter 7, 11 through 18. It says, if then perf perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear said to be in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? I want to stop right there. I want to clear up something so we don't go any farther adrift. In America today, if you've ever been a law enforcement officer, lawyer, or judge, or whatever, somewhere in the field, okay, we know that there, there is a law, but we also know that there's aspects of certain laws. Okay, do you get it? In other words, in the vehicle code, we call the vehicle code, it comes from the vehicle code, we find a number of different things that you could violate to uh, get your ticket or get jailed or anything else, right? So I want to stop here because he mentions the law, but what he's going to be talking about is a certain aspect of the law. Okay? So I'm going to stop right there. You got it? We're going to be talking about a certain aspect of the law. Okay, so let's read that again. If then perfection came to the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, but further need was what further need was there for another priest to appear said to be in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron. For when there, there is a change of priesthood, there must be a change of law as well. For one, for the one these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. No one from it had served at the altar. Now it is evident that our, our master came from the Judah and Moshe said nothing about the tribe concerning priests. And this becomes clearer if, if another priest like Melchizedek appears who did not become a priest based on legal command concerning physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it was te had been testified, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So the previous command is annulled by, because it was weak and unprofitable, for the, perfect, the law perfected nothing, but a better hope is, is in, introduced through which we draw near to Elohim. None of these, this happened without an oath. For other became priests without an oath. But he became a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the, the master, Yahweh, has sworn, and he will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Now, just thinking about that, forever, does that mean what happened prior to 
not only what happens later, forever is forever, right? Hmm. How interesting. So in this, in this word perfect, okay, he, he mentions the perfection or perfect. Uh, in the Greek means completing, perfecting, fulfilling, or accomplishment. But, but it, to listen to this, it means the event which consummated the promise. Oh. We're going to talk about the sin sacrifice. Because we're consummating a promise. Now, this actually happened years ago. A lot of years ago. Turn with me. Now, the, let's go over to the dictionary. also says a promise is a declaration that one will do or refrain from doing something. So based upon the definition of what a promise is, okay, let's go to, to, to Genesis chapter 12. Let's start, just start building a little bit on this promise. Genesis chapter 12. And I just want to read verses 1 through 3. And it says, Then Yahweh said to, to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives and your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will, I will bless you, and I will make your, your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who... who who treat you with contempt, and all of the peoples on the earth, that word in the Hebrew is mishpoka. Uh-oh. Do you mean there was a plan all those years ago for the world to be saved? Go figure. I wondered where they came up with that John 3.16 thing. Right? Mishkopa, ooh, the peoples of the earth, and will be blessed through you. So Yahweh tells Abram what he promises to do, and through Abram. Abram will be a great nation, and, and we'll, we'll, um, we're going to take a look at that in, in uh, uh, Genesis 15, starting in verse 5. He took him outside, Yahweh took Abraham, Abram outside, and said, look at the sky and count the stars. If you're able to count them, then he said to him, your offspring will be as that numerous. Abram believed Yahweh, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you from Ur to the Chaldeans to give you this land to, to, to possess. Now, here's a guy that doesn't even have a child yet, okay? In fact, there's some controversy that takes place over that. They try to help Yahweh later on, right? That did not go well. It's not going well for us today either, right? But he made a promise to Abram that he was going to make him his offspring more numerous as the stars in the sky. And if we tie that in with chapter 12, we find out that, that the people that he's are going to be in this line or in his lineage aren't necessarily from where he is, right? They're going to be peoples of the world. They're going to be, you know what he uses there, the word, you know what the word is, the peoples? It's goy. Ooh. That's the even worse word, <laughs> right? Does that, if you look at that, that could also be translated heathens, right? So there's got to be a change made here somewhere. If we go to Genesis chapter 17, I want to look at verse 8. And to you and your future offspring, I will give the land where you are residing, all the land of Canaan, as an eternal possession, and I will be their, their Elohim. Hmm. 
we find out that there's a promise that involves some land now. That he's going to give. Listen, he's going to give this land of Canaan, which, was, which belonged to who? Yeah. Okay. And he's going to give them that land. And the, the, the people that somehow come under the lineage of Abraham are going to possess it later. How does that work? There's a change that had been planned from the beginning to take place. Are you getting this? This was this. He, he listen. In the, you remember the I talked about the 400 years uh, between Malachi and, and Matthew that that everybody tells you. Well, that's when Yahweh was silent. Some people actually said that the first half did not go well. So that's the period where Yahweh made up a new plan. That's the only way you could get that he changed anything. By the way, he wasn't silent. He says he always talks to us. He's always there. He's always working around us, right? He's always at work. He's, he's only silent to when we don't, we're not looking for him. Amen? So the writer is beginning to question to, to his, in his listener's mind, if you will, of the Hebrews, what need would there be for another priesthood? If, in fact, the Levitical priesthood could have consummated the promise, okay, then what, would there, what need would there be for a Melchizedek, a priest? By the, in the order of Melchizedek, okay? The writer develops this idea that there was a weakness within the priesthood of the Levitical priesthood. And that weakness, number one, was the sacrifice that was given had to be given for the high priest first before he could give sacrifice for the people. Let's go back to Hebrews. Some would describe this as a change. Now, I, he uses the word change in there. I really don't like the way that's translated. Okay? I just really don't like it. Um, I, I think it should be a, maybe a word different or something like that. And the reason being is if it was a change, why did they, they add Hebrews chapter 8? <laughs> okay? Listen to Hebrews chapter 8, starting at verse 1. You're going to hear about this again. It says, now the main point of what is being said is this. We have this kind of high priest who sat down at the right hand of, of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and true tabernacle that was set up by, by Yahweh and, and not men. Uh, okay, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it was necessary for the priest also to have something to offer. Now, if, if, if he, meaning Yeshua, were, the, were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest since there are, are, are those offering the gifts prescribed by the law. The, these serve as a copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moshe was warned when, when he was about to, to complete the tabernacle. For Yahweh said, be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. Is it, you getting it? There's this tabernacle, the true tabernacle, that wasn't made by man, that was in the heavens, that is in the heavens, and it was there before. And the one that was on the earth was a shadow of the one up there, and those who serving in the temple down here as a shadow of the one. So when you look at Aaron and Moshe, who are they, who are they a shadow of? The high priest, Melchizedek. In the order of Melchizedek. Do you know that when, when in, in chapter 14, do you know 
that when uh, Abram met with Melchizedek, it says that he was the king and also priest of the city of Salem. Do you know that that word Salem in the Hebrew is as, actually a, an ancient way to say Jerusalem? Whoa. You see, we think things changed because we're only viewing the physical part of things instead of the heavenly one that was made without hands, without man's hands. It was made by Yahweh. Amen? Let's go to 14. Let's go to Genesis 14. I love going all over the Bible. It turns out that it's all connected. (laughs) You think he was trying to tell us something? Let's look at verses 18 through 20. 17 through 20. It says, After Abram returned from defeating... Uh, the, the kings that he, who, who were with him, the king of Sodom went out uh, to meet him in the valley of, of Shaveh, Shaveh, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, like I said in Hebrew, it's an ancient form of Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine. He was a high priest to, 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 uh, to Yahweh Most High. He blessed them and said, Abram is blessed by, by the Yahweh the Most High, a creator of heaven and earth, and I give praise to um, Yahweh Most High, who has, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. There he is. And so who was that? That was Melchizedek, right? Hmm. Could it be do you know that, that it was Yeshua that, was, that he talked to in a burning bush? Moses did. It seems like this, that the Yeshua aspect kind of follows him around. Do you think that he was trying to teach over periods of time, this is what this is about? It's about what's really going on? This is a picture of it? This is what it looks like? Because he says in Hebrews, he says that the bulls, the the blood of bulls, cannot save anyone. But they were a picture of the one that could. Now why am I talking about this? We started off in Romans 8. Why am I talking about this? Because what Paul was saying is that I thank God Elohim, for the report I hear about you through Yeshua, Messiah. That's, remember I said the word through is highly important because he's not only going through Yeshua HaMashiach, he's going through Yeshua High Priest. He's offering up a a, a sacrifice of, of praise, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand is that that sacrifice of thanksgiving isn't like what we think today. We think today that if we come and sing a few songs and we we say some nice things to one another and we say some nice things about Yahweh, then it's all good. But do you know for them to offer a sacrifice, they had to prepare themselves. They didn't just go to the, to the tabernacle. And they just didn't go anywhere to, to sacrifice. They went to the, the, the temple or the tabernacle, and they, they met with the priest there, and they, 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 they said something to him about this thanksgiving, and he offered a sacrifice. But the guy himself that brings the sacrifice had to prepare himself. It's all over Scripture. Every time that they, they're going to meet with Yahweh, they, perceive, they prepare themselves. <laughs> they take a bath. They wash their clothes. 
They mentally get ready to meet with Yahweh. And that's what Moses always told them, is that you need to prepare yourself. You see, what they, they believed, it, 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 is, it was true, they believed that that, that temple, that tabernacle, I'll, I'll get there, tabernacle represented Yahweh's presence. And if they were going to meet with him, even though it was a priest, they were going to meet with Yahweh through that priest, right? And so they were to prepare themselves. You just didn't come to congregation and say, I'll, I'll sing now. There was a preparation. There's, and there's still a preparation. Because you know what? You're not coming here to meet with just me or just you each other. You're coming here to meet with him. Amen. We need to prepare ourselves even if it's just of the sacrifice of thanksgiving. We need to prepare ourselves to go and meet with, with Yeshua Messiah, our high priest. But you know what? We've never really been taught that. We've been taught that only about the sacrifice that he gave for our sins. They're still sacrifices, folks. And we're supposed to give them. And it's about our lives. There's a song uh, that they sang today. What was it? Uh, Life song. Can you put that up, that first page? I give... <laughs> listen to me. I give the worship team just... The, the verse, our chapter of verse that I'm going to be speaking on, I don't tell them what I'm teaching. Okay? And they pray about it, and then they put the music together. Okay? Here it is. Empty hands held, held, held high, such a small sacrifice, if not joined with my life, I sing it made tonight. It's not okay to come with our empty hands. It's okay when our hands are coming with the offering of my life to Him. It's what Paul says in, in Romans chapter 12. Let's go there. He says it so much better than I do. Starting with verse 1. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of Yahweh, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Elohim. This is your spiritual wor worship. Do not be uh, conformed in this age, to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good and pleasing and perfect will of Elohim. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying that, that if, you, if you're not a living sacrifice and if your mind is conformed to this world in any way instead of being transformed, you don't even know what the good and perfect will of Elohim is. What a message. Because you know what? That takes it from the mundane every day, just coming and giving some kind of assent to preparing ourselves and to giving our life as a sacrifice to Him. May the words I say and the things I do make my life song bring a smile to you. Be a pleasing aroma to him. I'm 
I'm not trying to scare you people. I'm trying to prepare you. Because you know what? The truth is, if we don't get this down, we're going to have a horrible time in that desert. Come on. You know I'm right. We're going to play, be playing a lot of catch-up ball. The whole trip that Sharon and I were gone, I could not understand why it went the way it did. But then he began to show me that if you want to follow me, if you want to move when I move, then you've got to be careful to be seeing me when I move or when I stay. I thought, man, there's the answer to the question, am I seeing him at work around me? Am I seeing him move or stop? And am I following that? Do I move when he moves? Do I stop and hold it when he stays? Because I'm going to tell you something. If you do like they did and you, you don't stop when he stays, you remember those folks that went up anyway and got killed? There's a reason he has to stop. There's a reason that he has us being there. One of them, it may just be that he wants to meet with us, that he wants to, to have that time with us. But the other thing, he may be saving our lives. There's going to be an enemy. There is. But it's going to become even more important. There's going to be an enemy, and if we don't do what he says to do, that enemy will get us. To me, this is becoming more and more important all the time because I no longer can afford to make mistakes that I've made in the past. I'm not saying I'm not going to make mistakes, but I don't want to make the same one twice. You understand? You know, I... I'm not getting younger. I figured that out by looking in the mirror this morning. Okay. <laughs> what has happened to you, Ricky? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but making mistakes, you know you're going to have to be tested on that again. And if you make the same mistake twice, what's to say that you're going to be protected? I'm going to probably be in the same one this next week because I want to look at the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I want to look at that, what that looks like. I want to see if we can begin to put together the, the pieces of what it looks like to us today. He tells us, he's told us all through his word not to come empty-handed. We take it from Moedim's. But did you realize that Sabbath is a Moedim? Wow. Okay. We could talk now. Lord brought something to mind this week that just fits so perfectly with what you just said. In the story of Jeremiah, um, he has prophesied about the coming destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, and he's telling the people that they need to give in, give in to the Nebuchadnezzar and everything will go well. And in the answer to his prophecy, they throw him in the cistern. Of course, probably most people know this story. But there's a, an official in the palace, his name is Ebed-Melech, and he convinces the king that he needs to help 
Jeremiah out of the cistern. So they help him out of the cistern. And it's after the um, Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem and everything serves as judgment, he, he talks to Jeremiah and he tells him to go back to this palace official, Eben Melech, and tell him that because he trusted the Lord, that even though his eyes saw the destruction of Jerusalem, that he was going to save him from the sword and rescue him. Eben Melech wasn't even a child of, of Israel. He was a Cushite. He was a Gentile. So for me, that gave me kind of a hope that even in the midst of God's judgment, that he will specifically pick out people to save that in his mind had trusted him. So as we go through, um, Apostle Paul was talking about how we are given not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of the Son. And as I listen to people talk about the coming judgment, the election, if we don't get the one we want, doom and gloom, we're going to have destruction and all this. And to me, that is just the spirit of fear coming out of their mouths, causing division. And we don't have the spirit of fear. We're given the spirit of the Son. Now, the name of Eben Melech means servant of the king. And we are to be the servant of the king. And through us, the king, his light and his power is supposed to shine to everybody else. And that king is King Jesus, who is also our brother and our savior. Uh, I believe that it was uh, a change of the law for the priesthood because he found fault with the people and not with his own covenant. I think uh, Melchizedek priesthood was supposed to be his original uh, Let me ask you this. Purpose. Let me ask you this. Going into uh, Levitical priests being uh, appointed Levitical priests, did they ever have sin in their life? The Levitical priesthood? Yeah. Okay. Here's the reason. We're talking about, he's talking about the change in, 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 um, in, in the sacrifice, but he's also talking about an order that was set in place prior to any of this, okay? And so basically he's, he was talking about this tabernacle not being the real tabernacle. It's a shadow picture of the tabernacle from in the heavens, Okay, so really what we're looking about is that he's, he's described it as a change, but it's really not it's because it was from the beginning. Okay, so the change comes in our minds because all we see is the physical shadow picture of the heavenly one. You see what I mean? And so he was, he was, he was appointed, Yeshua was appointed as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek all along. Okay, so we're just going back to that. Uh, so that he's, he's bringing us through that because he gave his sacrifice, the one that could actually consummate the promise. The, the bulls, he said, didn't really do anything. They were just a picture of the one that consummated the promise. You see what I mean? With his blood. And so those were all pictures. And what he was trying to do is put a picture for us together so we'd be able to realize what the, the true tabernacle was in the heavens, and what the purpose, what they were doing, or what he was doing in the heavens as a high priest. So we still, we, we've, we've kind of gone, gone this way, we've kind of gone back, I would say, rather than uh, change something. From the beginning, it was supposed to be that. He, Yeshua uh, actually gave the first sacrifice uh, to, to, to uh, Adam and, and, and Eve. You see what I mean? So... Um, it, we can't start midstream. We have to go back and take a look at it. Where, where did, why did this all happen? And that's what he says. You're that priest forever. There was, there was never a time when you were not the, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. You see? And so um, I don't believe that it just changed mid, midstreams. I think that we have to work on what that idea of change is. Okay. Uh, because it's not really a change if we're going back to what was started in the first place, in my mind, okay? Uh, change oftentimes brings the uh, 
kind of a condemnation of it, it made it completely different. Well, it didn't really make it completely different. It changed, uh, for instance, no longer, no longer the bulls for sin, okay, to his blood for, for sin, right? And we don't have to have a high priest that has to go in and sacrifice for himself first because we know that he's perfect. He, he, he's never had to have a sacrifice for himself first. And so he, that, that makes him the perfect sacrifice. See? I hope that made it as clear as mud or something. I don't know. I, I agree. This is how I explain it. There was no change in any law. But it was after the golden calf incident that he instituted the Levitical priesthood. But it was just painting a picture. It's the same thing as your teacher making you write 100 times on the chalkboard. I will not do this. I will not do this. He said, okay, I'm going to set up this system that's going to show you <laughs> that you cannot do that. See what I'm saying? It, there was no change in the law. It's the same law. And, and I was talking to Marty about this earlier when we were talking about what is real and what is not. We how we view this physical life of ours as the real life. This is really the picture life. The real life is the spiritual realms that we live in. Yeah, so we this, have to get So our this is kind of like the Levitical priesthood here, that we, the thing we can see. And that's why he did that, so they could see this. They set up the Levitical so they could see it with I, fleshly I believe, eyes. I believe that our eyesight begins to change Yes. Um, as as we, as our relationship with him begins to change, okay, we we we're, we're the more developed our relation or mature our relationship is with him, the more spiritually uh, our vision is, and that's about walking in the light. Of course, we've gone over that and over that. So, right, the way I'm hearing this, um, the ultimate goal is relationship, mm -hmm. our oneness with God, and so what is given to us in the Old Testament that types and shadows and uh, the way to relationship because I, I appreciate what you said about uh, Mishpokim, uh, Mishpoka uh, for uh, families or whatever because I'm thinking of um, in Abraham uh, at one point didn't God say to Abraham your descendants shall be as the sand and he's saying as the stars and so some people look at that as there's a natural lineage of Abraham the bloodline and then there's the spiritual language of that. And so it naturally, uh, not all are Israel who are of Israel, if that's put all right. And so as a wild olive branch through Yeshua, I'm grafted into the spiritual Israel. And so you become as one who's as one of the lineage of, of the stars. Um, Paul in uh, Ephesians 3.14 says, for this reason I bow my feet a knees before the Father, through whom every family in heaven and earth are named. So there's a heavenly family. And so, um, and that reminds me of like in Colossians, it says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, because it's through Christ I'm grafted in, if therefore you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so when you're talking about true worship and coming to God, um, Yeshua in, in John 14, talking to the Samaritan woman, says, uh, but the hour is coming, and now is, that the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must be in spirit and truth. And, and we are of the descendant of the stars. Of We're seeking the things above. He is spirit. He is above. And that's how I'm grafted in through Yeshua uh, in that way. And it's a true heart-to-heart -heart meeting with Yahweh is the goal. That's the ultimate goal of everything. I was going to say, I see it more as a, not so much a change of the law, but a change of focus. Instead of looking at the earthly shadow, 
It's looking at the heavenly that has always been there. So, yes, and that all plays into that. We can't even praise him. Approach him in our praise is an abomination to him, actually, scripture if says it don't he, come through Yeshua. Scripture says that he gives us even the will and the desire. Yes. Okay, so if, if, it, if it's not him involved, we wouldn't even have the will or the desire to come before him or to seek him out. So, um, you know, when you look at everything, nothing, I come, I really come to the altar myself with, with nothing but sin, Right? And offer that up. That's what this guy in the, in the song is saying. He's saying what we're, we're, we're making our sacrifice to him too light. It's, it kind of makes it in vain. It kind of makes it void. Because if, if, I, if, I don't, if I'm not coming to him with my whole life as a sacrifice to him, then, I, then I'm, I'm not really worshiping. I'm not really coming to him. Uh, with a true sacrifice. Years ago, um, this is 20 years ago or more, but I caught a section of a award show or something. But anyway, I caught it because I'm walking by the t and uh, I hear uh, Limp Biscuit, and he comes up. And I didn't know who Limp Biscuit. I was like, I got to see this guy. But he walks up there, big awards, fancy, in his sweats and the first thing out of his mouth was, I praise God for the evil music that he was getting an award for. And, and, and that's it. That's a picture. He, was, he didn't have a relationship with Yeshua. That was an abomination. And our praise is an abomination without Yeshua. No man cometh to the Father. No man approaches to the Father. He don't hear your prayer unless it's through Yeshua. Hallelujah. Well, I'm just wondering, um, I've heard it said that Melchizedek was actually, actually Yeshua. There's, uh, there's some that believe that he's the pre-incarnate uh, Yeshua. Uh, some don't. Some others believe that he's a uh, he was a descendant of, um, oh. huh? Yeah, Shem. So, he was Shem himself, um, actually. I personally believe that he was a, he's a pre-incarnate Messiah. So. Mm. Right. So that, that's where I stand. And I'm sticking to it no matter what. <laughs> Anyone else? How about if we do some announcements real quick? Okay. Remember the Thursday night prayer meetings uh, right here in the, in the auditorium uh, between 6 and 7 on Thursdays? Uh, there's some prayers. They're faithful at it. And they're praying for all of us. So if, you, if you're a prayer warrior especially, be here, be square, right? Okay. Uh, Festival of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, um, October 2nd uh, through 4th. Uh, and we haven't really talked about it. We're just going to do it here, right? Um, it's my thought. It's what we did last year. Um, and so we'll, we'll put out some times for, for when we do that. We'll do a little planning. Um, October 12th is the Day of Atonement. Hmm. That means what? Fast. Usually what we do on, on that day is we break fast um, in a meeting. So we come together and there's some blessings and so forth that we go through, actually repentance stuff that we go through. And uh, then we get to, we, we usually uh, bring together goodies <laughs> And we break fast with goodies. We haven't eaten all day, so we shove sugar in us, you know. <laughs> you, could, you could bring healthy stuff, too. Like. <laughs> and uh, from Monday, air, air, uh, uh, 16th, 
uh, to Monday, October 24th, is Sukkot. We have Sukkot sign-up uh, sheets back in, there, back in the foyer on the, on the cabinet back there. The, I want to bring this out clearly because the 15th, if you're not registered by the 15th, okay, the price goes up by 10 bucks. Yeah. The 15th of this month, of September, okay? Now, I have something else to talk about. Um, I don't know if everybody knows, but uh, last Monday evening, I got a call from uh, Larry, the pastor in Stella, Tennessee. He was on the side of the road, and he was, uh, had just released uh, himself from giving CPR to his wife to the EMTs that showed up. Um, apparently, she had three seizures in the day, in one day. And the third one shut her heart down, and she stopped breathing. And so he pulled her out. She had vomited, so he pulled her out and tried to get all the vomit out and begin CPR. He gave CPR for about 12 minutes uh, before the EMT showed up, and they worked on her for maybe another uh, 5 or 10. We were praying um, while it was all going on. I was praying with him, and um, when, we, when I said amen, it, they said, I mean, it, I just no more asked Sharon. I no more got it out of my mouth, and her heart started again. Okay, but she was never able to breathe on her own. Um, so I got a call Wednesday night or Wednesday evening um, that she passed away. She was 33 years old. And um, they're in a position where they cannot, they don't, he doesn't have the money to bury her. Um, he's, the, 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 the funeral arrangement is, is uh, on the low side is, uh, is $8,400. He's got about $2,200 gathered toward that now. And so if you feel led to help out, please, um, please give money to today. Give money to uh, Elizabeth Steele, raise your hand, okay, uh, to help them out, and we'll get that money back to them. Um, I've been on, I've been working with him all week. Um, he's a pretty broken man, and so keep him in your prayers, lift him up. Uh, he was, he called me one day, and I guess that he was getting around in the morning, and he couldn't find his sock, and he was running around the house trying to find his sock, and he looked down at his foot with no sock and just began to weep because he said he realized that, that, uh, that half of him was gone. And so um, remember him in your prayers, too. He was better yesterday, yesterday when I talked to him. He'd been to, to try to work out some of the details and get some of the details back to me. So, um, like I say, if you're going to give, if you want to give, feel led to give, give it to, to Elizabeth so that we can gather that money and get it back to him as quickly as possible. Larry Davenport. The, he's got two daughters, by the way. One is nine and one is 14. And so um, he's going to be raising those two um, children and pastoring a, a congregation as well. So. Okay, uh, you want, ready to be blessed? Okay, you want to stand? And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, tell Aaron and his sons how you're to bless the Israelites. Say to them, may Yahweh bless you and protect you. May Yahweh make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh look with favor on you and give you shalom. In this way, they will pronounce my name over the Israelites and I will bless them. <laughs> Yahweh, 
back to you, Yahweh, and we shall return. Renew our days. Renew our days as of old. Amen. 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 And you may be seated.